that is capable, has a core competency for executing contingency relief and reconstruction operations. We heard from the first panel that these matters are diffused among a number of agencies, most pointedly Department of Defense and Department of State. We heard about silos mentioned. People are operating in silos, departmental uh, lines, departmental funding differentials, uh, weak de core competencies that aren't suited to the missions uh, that, that we're asking those departments to execute. Indeed, the, the very question of today's hearing, is the State Department ready, implies a competency question, because it's happening, as Mr. Tebow uh, uh, articulated, but are they capable? Uh, and, and as, as Ambassador Watson pointed out, this, this, this addresses a core competency issue within the State Department. The State Department, is, as, as the Ambassador identified, is in the mission of diplomacy, not relief and reconstruction operations. This is a new development. And, and I, the DOD has also expanded its capacity over the five, last five years. It, it is my view, and, and we articulated it in a report of this past January or February that the United States needs to develop an integrated entity that brings together the capacities of state, defense, aid, treasury, ag, justice, all who play a role in these operations, into something called the U.S. Office for Contingency Operations that actually is in charge of relief and reconstruction operations. There is no focused responsibility, and thus you don't have people to call and hold accountable here at this table for outcomes in the, the uh, contingency operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. There is no one person involved. And the Commission identified that when it called representatives from DOD state and aid and said, who is running the reconstruction program in Afghanistan? And they weren't able to get a clear answer. It was frustrating for them, frustrating for you all I know, and frustrating for the taxpayer most significantly in that it results in waste. I'm sorry. What, what more do we need to do? I'm talking about now members of Congress uh, to make certain that um, this waste, fraud, and abuse, and stupidity is eliminated. Well, I think there is the larger reform issue that is still hanging out there and needs to be addressed, something that, that achieves integration in planning and execution. But that's, that's, a, and that's an important long-term solution that could make a difference in Afghanistan today. We are going up to $70 billion in Afghanistan next year, the, the largest uh, contingency operation in history. But I think in the short term in Iraq, which is what this hearing is about, uh, I think having a, bringing to the table uh, not so much the secretaries, but the, the managers, the, 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 uh, the chief financial officers, the, uh, the director of uh, acquisition management, State Department, the director of diplomatic security. I mean, 725 million has already been approved by the Congress uh, for security in Iraq. I think it's an important question. How is that going to be managed? They're going to 7,000 new contractors. You've raised concerns in your first panel about whether they have capacity to manage that. Well, those are tough questions to ask those who are going to manage that money. The second question is: We've identified largest contract in State Department history, most important continuing issue: police training in Iraq largest uh, single chunk of funding that they are going to be spending over the next year. Uh, are there enough in-country contracting officers on the ground to oversee the execution of that program? Uh, we've, you know, our audits speak for themselves. The answer in the past has been no. Uh, the director of INL in-country assured me that there would be. Uh, I think it is a fair question for you to ask, is there? And I yield to the gentleman from uh, California. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bowen, I want to thank you for your service, for your many trips to a very dangerous place in the world, and for your diligence in bringing one after another failures to our attention. I also want to thank you for the many times you brought some potential sanity and solutions uh, to the process. I would like to dwell into sort of mixing that first panel and the problems that they were we focused on mostly the transition and the, uh, the absence of certain expertise at State, and your concerns today. Uh, some years ago, uh, before my time, Goldwater Nichols was passed. But I was a soldier before, and I have seen the military after. The military today plays better in the sandbox. 
they have officers who have gone to each other's war colleges and senior uh, staff officers. They have had assignments in each other's backyards whenever possible. And as a result, my observation has been, if we have to do joint activities, we have people who have comfort and, uh, and experience in doing that. Mm -hmm. Would you say from your time of watching State and DOD and the various people contracted to do various functions in Iraq that we need to look at exactly that. We need to look at building up an interoperable culture between different agencies that in situations like Iraq and Afghanistan have to work together. Absolutely. Matter of fact, the reform proposal that, that I have discussed we term beyond Goldwater Nichols. This is a civilian version of it. It is it's a rough analogy, but it, 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 it seeks the same outcome, jointness, because integration, not coordination. And there are coordinated meetings all the time in Iraq, but coordination lasts usually as long as the meeting does. You go out, you go down the hall, you go out into the field, it is difficult to operate on agreements. You need to have it trained. You need to have it authorized. You need to have it appropriated and overseen. In other words, driven by this Congress, uh, shaping an administration structure that can achieve our national security goals. This, this is about uh, protecting our national security interests in a very unique setting, something new that is not defense, not development, not diplomacy. The fourth D is really is what we call it. Well, earlier on in the first panel, and, and the, uh, the chairwoman here uh, brought it up as a former ambassador, uh, we, we sort of beg those questions of do we need a new entity with direct authority? Do we need direct funding? Do we need to make sure that, that what is asked for is then delegated or assigned to the most efficient source, not simply each one trying to get the money but not spend it uh, to do the job, because that is inherent when you have other issues. Would you comment on, on how you view us doing that? Recognizing Iraq is, to a certain extent, yesterday's story, but Afghanistan is still today's story and likely tomorrow's. And I think you began to address that with Mr. Green about the joint funding mechanism that, that Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates are coming to agreement upon. Secretary Gates proposed it last December. It is a dual key approval process, and it is a step in the right direction towards this integration in, in management, in execution. Uh, but it is only, it's only funding. Funding is only a piece of it. You, you, you just can't pour more money into the State Department or into uh, the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization or into the this, this security pool. It is really a funding pool. And expect it to get executed in an integrated way. The other pieces of the puzzle have to be put in place to ensure that you get the performance you expect. And funding is a good step. It is what the, 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 the United Kingdom has done through their conflict pools. Uh, but they have also taken steps further that have, have sought to bring personnel, IT, contracting, oversight, planning uh, into one executory system, which is what we are proposing, so that there is accountability, there is responsibility, so that planning is done ahead of time. Well, when you envision this uh, within the U.S. system, the ambassador in Baghdad is presidentially uh, nominated, Senate confirmed. The uh, commander on the ground is presidentially selected, Senate confirmed. Mm -hmm. Do you envision that in these situations, special but not unique as we see them appear around the world, that we should consider having positions in which funding coming from much multiple agencies goes to a designated person, whether it is directly appointed by the President or agreed on by the Cabinet officers, who then goes for confirmation and controls those funds and personnel based on a, if you will, a congressional mandate? Yes, that is exactly what we proposed in our latest report, that there ought to be a, someone who has been confirmed by, by the Congress who is responsible for specific funds given appropriated by the Congress for a specific mission, the contingency relief and reconstruction of Iraq, Afghanistan, or wherever. And, and that creates within our system, and that is how accountability happens. You are able to identify clearly through authorization who is responsible through appropriations, responsible for what, and, and ultimately through oversight, did you do it? And, and that is a system that doesn't work well in this unique, uh, relatively modern evolution in protecting our national security interests abroad. Instead, we have a massive expansion of COIN and stabilization ops at the Department of Defense, filling a space, as General Petraeus has said, that wasn't being filled, 
And then you have the creation of new personnel centers over at State Department, SCRS, but not with program funds or with, with authorized missions that enable them to get out and execute that program or enough authority to, to operate in an interagency fashion. That, that's I, I thank the gentleman. I thank the yeah. gentlelady yield back. Time to um, Ms. Norton. I didn't know if we were leaving. You have five minutes. Uh, I, I, I thank you very much, Mr. Bauer. Uh, what you had to say was, um, particularly in the last panel, <clears throat> disturbing, um, but perhaps expected. Um, Besides the State Department, um, how is the consultation that you describe with no central entity responsible, how is that consultation happening? Who, surely as they get together, <laughs> they, they uh, understand that somebody has to be responsible for being in touch with the others, or are they all operating separately and independently? Um, these various agencies, I think you have named them, are they operating independently, without coordination, without consultation? The, there is a directive, uh, NSC directive, the Interagency Management System uh, adopted in 2007 that created the Integration Planning Cell. And that does bring representatives from State and aid and other civilian entities together. Uh, within the NSC's, under the NSC's aegis uh, to, to, to plan. However, it, the actual operations are less integrated, are less uh, coordinated, and, and as a result, less effective on the ground. Now, they are operating now. Yes. Uh, but the State Department isn't in charge now. The, 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 I mean, the, you know, the Defense Department is still there and on the ground. Well, uh, well, it's who, uh, is the State Department considered the lead, uh, uh, or, or the, 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 the armed forces? Are they really giving the direction at this point? Well, it's it's uh, trif trifurcated, frankly, the the oversight. Uh, we're and we're still operating under uh, a presidential directive, NSPD thirty six, which put the State Department in charge of overseeing civilians who are participating in the reconstruction program, but left it to the Defense Department to, um, to manage police training and, and training of the Army. Uh, the, where the, the, the program has evolved beyond the framework and the ad, the ad hoc measures put in place back in 2004, um, but, but there is no governing uh, law, so to speak, which is what I am proposing, that, that to provide clarity through specific authorization that identifies those duties outside the context of a particular situation, but, and that thus allows appropriations to be effectively executed and, and someone to be held accountable, ultimately, for their outcomes. That, that system is not currently in place. Now, now, you believe this has to be statutory authority? Yes, for it to endure and not be an ad hoc solution. Have you seen any indication that the administration agrees that there needs to be statutory authority? They agreed with our identification of the problems that, that I have been articulating, but they have not endorsed the statutory solution. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, your being here today. There are many more questions we would like to ask, but there is a vote on the floor. So uh, since members are leaving to uh, take part in the vote, uh, we are going now to say that without objection the record shall be left open for seven days so that members may submit their questions for the record and so there might be questions coming to you Happy for a written response. And we certainly appreciate you being here. Thank so, you. without objection, I'll, I'll enter the binder of the hearing 
documents into the committee record, and the committee shall now stand adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you.